water. Right. So one way to answer the question of what is a heterogeneous mixture would be to provide an example. So we can look at oil and water as a heterogeneous mixture. Any other guesses? I would say a good answer to that might be a heterogeneous mixture is one in which there is a visible separation. For those of you that are, are snickering or laughing might notice that that is on the slide. Yeah. It's perfectly acceptable to use the information in front of you. All right. So if there's a visible separation, we're looking at a heterogeneous mixture. Oil and water. When we put oil and water together, what happens? They separate. Okay? They separate into two liquids that don't mix. Okay? That would be heterogeneous because there's a visible separation. Okay? Visible can be a hard definition to work with, and that's why we've got it in kind of quotes there. The other kind of definition that I think works well is multiple phases. So what phase is oil? Liquid. What phase is water? Liquid. Does that fit the multiple phases rule? Yes. Why yes? Because they're both it's two different phases. I mean, it's two phases. <laughs> they are both liquids, but are those liquids with each other? No. No. So it is still two distinct phases. So it still fits in the multiple phases rule. What if I took sand and put that in water? And I shook that up. I see sand floating around in the water. You can still physically see the sand, so that might fit under the visible separation. If we make the sand really small, we may not be able to see it because our eyesight isn't that good. Okay? Are there still two different phases? Will the sand ever dissolve in water? No. So I have a solid in a liquid. That's still a heterogeneous mixture. Okay. Here's a personal favorite of mine because it kind of floats back and forth between those. Anybody seen, I know we're in Arizona, but anybody seen fog before? Yeah, okay. What is fog? Heterogeneous, homogeneous? It's moisture in the air. Well, there's moisture in the air in here too, right? It's kind of a tricky one. Moisture in the air in this room is homogeneous. We can't see the different phase. Is fog a visible phase? Yes. Yeah. We're seeing actual droplets of, of moisture in the air. We can't see individual droplets because they're so small, but light is not passing through them. Why is light not passing through them? Because something is blocking them. That is a different phase. That phase barrier is what's causing it. So fog is an example of a heterogeneous mixture. Okay? It's a mixture of water and air. If we switched over to homogeneous, just air, we grab a sample out of the, for lack of a better word, air, okay? just fill the balloon with something. What's inside the balloon? Well, it's now a mixture of air. Well, what is it? Okay. There's water in it. How do we know there's water in it? Has anybody ever breathed on a mirror? What do you see when you breathe on a mirror? Moisture. You see the moisture, the condensation. Where did that condensation come from? Your breath. Your breath exhaled moisture. Anybody see that condensation right now? No. Why? It's homogeneous. Okay. Only when I exhale it onto the mirror does there, do I get a temperature change where it becomes a different phase. Okay, so air has water in it. So I could just jump into the ocean without any problems and just breathe under the ocean because air has water in it and so does the ocean. No, okay, what else does air have in it? Nitrogen. Okay, so I could just wrap my mouth around a nitrogen gas line and I could live forever. No, I'd probably die pretty quickly. Okay, why? What other stuff is in here? Oxygen. And oxygen is actually what we need to survive. So all of those different things are in our air. We can't see them because they're in a homogeneous mixture. They're not chemically bonded to each other. They're distinct individual pieces. 
right? If we were to say look at chemical formulas, which is again a borderline argument because theoretically you know nothing about that, right? which is technically not true, I most bet most of you know the formula for water. We don't have to think too much about that, but minimally, how many different things are in water? Two. two. How do you know two? There's two letters. Two letters. Yeah. Two different letters. Okay. You laugh and go, oh, that's obvious that it's too simple. That's chemistry. Okay. What is oxygen? Okay. That's a trickier question. So we got two answers coming out of that one. I heard O2 and I heard O. Technically, oxygen is going to be O2. Okay, again, we don't need to know the nuances of that. Is O2 different from H2O? Yes. How do I know the hydrogen and the oxygen in H2O are chemically linked, but spatially linked to the oxygen in O2? Is it because the oxygen is after the hydrogen? The oxygen up in H2O is chemically... Oh, okay, so you're saying that oxygen. Let's color some. So we've got purple oxygen and we have red oxygen, right? You're saying the purple oxygen is chemically linked to the water or to the hydrogen because? Comes immediately right after it. Okay, where is the other oxygen? Isn't right after it. Okay, what if I'd written H2O, O2? How do you know that that is still two separate things? That H2O, O2, written like that, is still two different things? This screen might be better to look at than that one. Let's make a, a little adjustment here that might help with that. How do you know those are two different things? If they were chemically linked, it would be H2O. So we could go through and say, well, one of our simplifications, if they're chemically linked, we would group everything together, so it would be H2O3. Now they're chemically linked. Everybody get that idea? So we're trying to string them together and make it as obvious as possible. Do I have to write it out as this kind of sequence? No. All right, there are a variety of ways to write this out. How do you know H2O and O2 up here are not chemically linked? You might either get angry at me or kick yourself if you hear the explanations I'm going to give you here. They're different colors. Okay. How did we code that information? I coded that information by using a different color that allows you to see that difference. Okay. What if they were all the same color? We might make the assumption they're chemically linked. Are we saying they're chemically linked? No, but it becomes confusing. We don't know. So when we go through and look at our formulas, we want to try and make it as clear as possible that they're distinct pieces. We can make them distinct pieces by using different colors. How many people have more than one color with them right now? Okay, so 10 people in the class. That doesn't work very well. So how else could we just make sure that we keep those as separate distinct species that aren't chemically linked? Can the comma? Comma. That's showing a difference. Okay, that works. A comma could easily get confused for a one, though. How else could we do it? Okay. One option is we could try and insert a dash and then O2. That one gets a, a bit unfortunate, as we'll learn, because dashes represent chemical bonds. This is now further misleading because we're actually saying it's a bond, so we don't want to use a dash. Okay. We could try and use colons. What about parentheses? Parentheses also become problematic. A slash? We could use a slash. We could use an and sign. Plus One sign. option I heard was a plus sign. Okay. If I said 2 plus 2, what are you going to tell me? Four. Four. So is 2 plus 2 just mean two distinct things? Or does that mean adding them together and do something? Dang it. How do I show that those are different things? As unconfusingly as I possibly can. <laughs> we can just leave a space in between. 
right? And that can be enough to symbol that or symbolize it. So we're using our language skills to try and come up with ways to separate these. Why do we need to do that? Because we're trying to be as clear as possible in our descriptions behind these. Okay? Everybody looks at science and says, oh, it's this big fancy thing. Really, it's just our, somebody's way that's no different than you of trying to come up with some way to distinctly identify those as separate. Okay? Kind of makes sense? So when we bring that information across to the other side, because if we take water as a gas and oxygen as a gas, okay, and again, it depends on the just sample we're looking at, we just call it air, we call it a homogeneous mixture. What if instead of looking at those two as just an air sample, I now say I just want to look at H2O? Okay, well, is it a mixture? No. No. Okay, it doesn't really make sense to reference H2O as a mixture. Well, why not? If I take multiple H2Os, are they chemically linked to each other? No. No, no they're spatially linked. Wouldn't that then be a mixture? No. Okay. The mixture needs to identify different chemical species. Okay. So what are they then? What is water? If it can't be a mixture, then we're moving into a pure, a pure substance. And when I look at the individual smallest unit of water, is it chemically linked? Is hydrogen chemically linked to the oxygen? Yes. How do I know that? Because they're together. People they're no together. Space. There's no space in there. <laughs> I'm showing that chemical linkage. Okay? So now is it a compound or an element? Compound. Why is it a compound? Because it has two elements. Okay? Whereas what happens when I move to oxygen? That one becomes an element. But aren't there two oxygens in oxygen? It's the same. Okay. It's only one type, so it is typically referenced as an element. It could be referenced as a compound or a molecule. It's just better referenced as the element because it's only one type. Kind of make sense? Okay. So when we're looking at matter, we'll look at each of these individual systems or individual mixtures versus pure compounds versus elements. And what we're trying to do is see how those things can potentially interact with each other. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is get an idea of what the periodic table does for us. Someone went through and made observations of the simplest things. A heterogeneous mixture is not simple. I have two different things in there with two different properties, both somehow interacting with each other. That means when I make an observation of that solution, am I observing, say, the liquid or the solid or the gas? It's confusing. I don't know. Okay? A homogeneous system might be a little bit easier to predict or work with because they're all in the same phase, but each of the compounds within it act differently. Okay? So an example that we could use there would be, say, Water in a homogeneous mixture with something else. We'll take water and those are too safe. Okay. I'm going to do HCl. Anybody know what HCl is? Hydrochloric acid. Okay. And we'll deal with nomenclature too in a little bit. But hydrochloric acid gets to the point. If I have a mixture of water and HCl, I have hydrochloric acid. Okay. If I had a beaker of water sitting on the counter, okay, that's now a pure thing or even salt, okay, and you stuck your hand in it, what's your observation? Your hand, gets wet. your hand gets wet. I now have a container with HCl and water. You stick your hand in it. Your, hand's gone. your hand melts. It's a bit dramatic, but it serves a purpose. What did it? Was it the water or was it the HCl? Okay. We know that because we know water isn't reactive, but what if we know nothing about either of those species? Okay. It could go bad really fast. We now don't know which one's the dangerous one. Mixtures aren't particularly easy to work with. Okay. The observations that we're making about them don't necessarily hold to just one. Okay. They could be a mixture of both in our observations, so we don't want to make observations about those. If we go to compounds, okay, that's at least consistent. If I look at just water, I can evaluate it. Okay. But for compounds, if I have different combinations, 
of those elements, am I going to get different results? We have water and H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. You ever had like a cut or something and they splash hydrogen peroxide on it? And you're like, oh yeah, that doesn't hurt at all. For those of you who are like, that doesn't hurt at all. You're a masochist or a sadist. I don't remember which one. But one of those. It bubbles up, it fizzes, and it kills stuff. Okay? Hydrogen peroxide is not pleasant. Okay? So that, again, makes things difficult. Okay? So what we try and do is boil it all the way down, go all the way out to the elements, evaluate just our elements, get all the information we can about the single unit, and then slowly start building up. And as we build up, if we build up methodically, we can slowly build our knowledge for this. Remember 800 years? Right. So there's lots of kind of access to this. Because elements are now kind of our fundamental building block, which is totally wrong, but we'll just work with it. Okay. 800 years ago, that's all they had. Okay. We come up with a table for all of our elements. A table of elements. We could then use the information on that table to build compounds. Once I have compounds, what could I do? I could build a table of compounds. Believe it or not, they have books of compounds, okay? and those aren't, don't cover everything. So we could do something like that. After we have compounds, we could then make mixtures. Okay? So we start all the way at the elements. That's what we're working with with our periodic table. So we want to know something about classifying those elements on the periodic table. And so where it initially started was looking at things called metals and nonmetals, because we saw distinct differences between them. Okay, so if we look at our metals and nonmetals, so let's left and right on this. Okay, some nonmetals come in as gases, okay, but most of our metals are solids. So if we see a gas, we're probably looking at a nonmetal. Okay. Simple observations. <coughs> Luster, meaning, is it shiny versus dull, not shiny? Malleable, you hit it, does it move? Okay. Versus brittle, you hit it and it shatters. Okay. So we made these observations. Okay. These observations are encoded into our periodic table. Okay. Well, how is all that information encoded? Partly how it's arranged, okay? So what do we see on our periodic table that could help us identify those arrangements? Metals are, in, well, like the lower left is more metallic and then it's okay. Name a metal. Uh, iron. iron. Way to pick the hard one. Iron symbol on this is Fe. Notice it's more on the left-hand side of the periodic table. Name another metal. I heard copper. Aluminum. Aluminum. Zinc. Okay, gold. Another fun one. Say that one again. Silver. Silver. Name a non-metal. Krypton. Krypton. <laughs> What's that? Neon. Neon. I can't. Jumping. Bromine, helium, really jumping. Are you made out of metals? Carbon. Carbon. Nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur. Where are all the non-metals? They're on the more right-hand side of the table. Where are all our metals? Left-hand side. Is there something that distinguishes those? There's that thin or that darker black line that indicates the difference between our metals and our nonmetals. Okay, on that staircase, what are we? A metal or a nonmetal? Semi-metal. We're somewhere in between. We're going to start to transition from being a metal to a nonmetal. So we could be a semi-metal. Okay, why do we call it semi-metals and not semi-nonmetals? Which word is longer? <laughs> okay. Semi-metal becomes an easier phrase because it's shorter. Okay. So you may hear them as semi-metals. You may also hear them referenced as metalloids. 
The metalloids are on that staircase. Are they perfectly on it? No, it's kind of a weird transition area, okay? Like all transition areas, okay? You get some properties of one, some properties of the other, and they aren't consistent, okay? So if we looked at our pictures, there are some non-metals. Those are intentionally tricky. What do you think those are? You could go as specific as the element. I was actually trying to go for metal, metalloid, or non-metal. Why are you saying metals? Okay, they're <laughs> solids, but aren't the non-metals also solids? So I don't accept that answer. Give me another one. Luster. Luster. They look shiny. That sounds like a metal. Okay. Could you do anything about malleability? But we don't know, so why can't you do anything about malleability by looking at the picture? It's a picture. It's a picture. Malleability you have to hit. Conducts heat or electricity? What was that one? Density. Don't know. Melting points. Don't know. Reacts with nonmetals. Okay, the only thing we really have to go off of are those top two. Based on those top two, those both or all three of those best match the metals. Turns out, of course, you're wrong. And all three of those happen to be metalloids, right on that transition. So they share some of the bulk characteristics of what we would expect out of metals. But if we went through and looked at those non-directly observable, we have to run an experiment to test, we see that they don't fit the exact definition for a metal. Okay. How could I test you on that? Because everybody wants to know that, right? So I got an um and I got a. Well, you could use an element that you I, know. I heard over here, somebody said it. I said you don't. You don't. That's right. I don't. Okay. Becomes very difficult to test on what is a metalloid based off of an image. Okay. I also find it a bit obnoxious to say which of these is a metalloid and be like, uh, carbon, silicon, bismuth, iodine. Okay. For those who don't know, let's try that again. C, S, I, B, I, and I. Is C touching the staircase? Yes. Is S, I? Is B, I? Yeah. Is I? Yes. I don't know how I would answer that one either. So I don't test on the metalloids. I test on nonmetals and metals. Okay? Because those are our clear distinctions. Okay. Within this, we've already, or at least I've already, started shouting out names of elements and then pointing to their symbols on the periodic table. Okay. Did I point to any name or symbol that you were like, I have no idea how you pulled that out of your head? <laughs> or you're like, I knew everything he just spouted. Seriously, you, well, you're all just like, I knew all of those. No. If you don't, if it's two different letters, then what it usually starts with, then you're like, wait, how'd you get that? Yeah, okay. So where did the names and the symbols come from? 800 years. Okay, and arguably for some of these, like gold, we're probably moving more towards thousands of years. Okay. So the names and their symbols have historical meaning. Okay. They go back to sometimes the discoverer, okay. sometimes to the origin, okay. what country they were in, or what language they spoke. Okay. So gold, A-U. Anybody know, I'm going to say Latin and hope I'm right? No one knows Latin? I swear, like, over the summer I met like six people that all studied Latin. I don't understand this. Okay. Since none of you know Latin, Okay, so then what's the word? No, I'm just saying, because none of us know Latin, we'll just say it's Latin. Well, that's going to be the next part, but here, the next <laughs> step is, it's aurora. Aura. Uh, not aura, aura is gold in Spanish, but it's A-U-R-O-A, <laughs> sure. Like Northern Lights Aurora? Uh, I remember, I'm just making this up. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say that out loud, though. Right? It is Latin. You look up the Latin for gold, the first two letters are 
AU. Okay. Uh, let's pick another one. Uh, shoot, I don't remember the history on that one. Let's pick uh, more fun ones that I do know the history on. Borium. Why would we call that borium? Okay. Bohr was a very famous scientist okay, that identified our atomic structure or our electronic structure. We thought that was such a cool discovery that we're like, you know what? We are going to immortalize you by naming an element after you. Here you go. You now have borium. Right? You're like, really? Yeah. Uh, for instance, how about 95 AM? You think you can read that? Americum. That's how I like to say it. It's probably more like americium, but... <laughs> But it sounds like America. Why? Because it was discovered in America. It was discovered in America. Okay. Uh, it was also discovered somewhere about the time that Element 97, BK, was discovered, which is? British Knights. Oh. Anybody remember that? <laughs> Berkelium. That sounds an awful lot like Berkeley. Isn't that a like, city in California with like, a famous research institution that discovered this element? Yeah, that's how it came about. Okay. CF? California. Californium, because California. also discovered by the guys that did Berkeley. Okay. But they already picked Berkelium and they couldn't call it Berkelium too. So they called it Californium. Okay. So the origins of these names sometimes have meaning back to the root language. Sometimes they sat down and said, I, I found it. I'm going to call it this. You want to challenge me? Let's go. Okay. We did a little bit better than that down here, but that's pretty darn close. Okay. So a lot of the names have German roots, Latin roots. Um, there's a little bit of English, and sometimes you'll see symbols change from different countries. Why would the symbols change? Language. The language is changing. Okay. For the most part, we try to keep consistent on that because we want a universal language. If we change all the symbols, then it makes, dif makes it difficult to communicate across continents. So which of those 100, my list only has 114, which of those 118 should you actually bother to know the name of? The ones that you put in our sheet. Yes. <laughs> right? There's a sheet, right? which I believe I actually referenced properly, files, references, elements for memory. You should open that elements for memory. Okay. In that file, it lists all of the elements that you're supposed to memorize. There's a lot on there. Literally, everything on that list is what you're supposed to memorize. I think that's too much, so I went through and bolded ones. If you want to pass this class and pass is all you're looking at, you better memorize the bolded ones. Okay. If you want to do anything better than pass, start working on all of them. If you have to take future chemistry classes, you need them all. Okay. All on that list. There's no reason you will ever need Californium or Berkelium. I apologize, because now you'll have those memorized. Right. <laughs> okay? So start working on those. It is important to have those memorized, because we want to be able to use them quickly. Okay? Which gets to memorization. You should memorize to save time, not memorize just so you know a random fact. Okay? The whole point of this memorization is to make your life easier when you have to work with it later on. Okay? Not because I expect you to have these all memorized in 10 years. Okay, so clear that away. This is where we jump into chapter four, which is looking at our models of atoms. Unfortunately, this is really just kind of a lot of memorization because this is just facts. This is a, we're now moving into a history class, right? So we're going to talk about the history of how we got to the models of atoms we have, because I think it's interesting. You don't think it's interesting? I don't care. You're still getting tested on it. Because I think it's interesting. Sorry, with the question, um, all those yep. elements, do you have to know, like, compound their... So there's a good part? question. I think I know where you're going. Sorry, I interrupted you. Sorry. Let's look at it. So I'm attempting to bold. So this is my bold version. You see boron in your list is one you should memorize, right? Right. Good. All right. So there it is, boron bold. What should you be memorizing? Okay, at this point, boron is 
Hb. Okay. If we look for boron here, we also see this number 5. We also see this number 10.811. Okay. Should you memorize those numbers associated with boron? A lot of that depends on your instructor. Your instructor for this semester has a really crappy memory. If I can't do it, I tend to not expect you to do it. And there are some exceptions, but for the most part, that's how it rolls. Why would I say it's not necessary to memorize it? We have these giant things posted to the wall that have that information on it. All it has on it, though, is that B is associated with 5 and 10.81. Okay? It does not tell you that that's boron. So at this stage, what you need to do is memorize boron to the symbol B. As we continue to move through, we will add information to that. Okay? I don't want to tell you what to add now because we don't have the basics of what an atom is first. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you build flashcards, not a bad idea. Just realize you'll be putting more information for each of those elements on the flashcard. I would also argue that information is already on the periodic table, but it's been encoded, and you don't know how to break that code yet. Okay? Is that good enough? Yes. So, scientists. Our first scientist, Dalton. Okay? Early 1800s. Dalton went through and started making observations about the matter he had around them and came up with some conclusions about atomic theory. Okay? Um, so his first rule is that an element is composed of tiny, indivisible, indestructible particles called atoms. Okay? That's roughly equivalent to what we call elements, except in his case, he's breaking it down further. He's now saying it as a single atom. So when we talked about O2, O2 is an element because it's one type. O2 is composed of two atoms. Okay. One atom, or sorry, two atoms of oxygen. How do I know it's two atoms? That's what that subscript two after it means. Okay, that's my numerical information for whatever directly comes in front of it. Okay, so that's how I've coded that information. So Dalton said O2 is made up of two oxygen atoms. Okay, and those oxygen atoms on their own are completely indestructible, indivisible. They are the smallest matter can get. Okay. The next rule, or law, or whatever you want to call it, his theory... All atoms of an element are identical and have the same properties. So if I take a look at a single oxygen atom and another oxygen atom, they are completely identical and indistinguishable. Everything about them is the same. Is that true? Yes. No. I actually already gave you a hint. You just drew them. No. I just drew them with two different colors. Matter didn't have color associated with it, but I'm a, a little foreshadowing. Yeah, that one's not true. Okay. Is the top one true? You all did some reading. What was your reading about? And at least one of you made it to isotopes. It's not true, because what can atoms be broken down into? Smaller pieces. Neutrons, protons, electrons. So we start off with Dalton's theory. His first two rules are wrong. Before you start going, what an idiot. 1800, okay, no cars, like we're still riding horses, okay, and he's coming up with these theories. And these, believe it or not, are pretty solid because we have observations to support them. Okay? Atoms of different elements combine to form compounds. So if I take hydrogen and I bond it to oxygen, I now have a compound. Yeah, he's not really drawing any big conclusions there. He's really just providing the definition of the word compound, multiple elements. Okay? Compounds contain atoms in small whole number ratios. When I take hydrogen and I combine it with oxygen, I can only combine single units of these. There were uh, multiples of single units. 
I can't go through and say I only want half an oxygen or half a hydrogen and one oxygen. Right, which understandably would be confusing because what the hell symbol is that I just write? Half an H. That was half an H. Yeah, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay? But I can have two H's. So as long as I go whole numbers, I can generate new compounds. And the rule is they have to be whole numbers. Okay? Last one, atoms can combine in more than one ratio to form different compounds. Right. Is HO a different ratio than H2O? Yes. yes. Are those different compounds? Yes. yes. HO, as we'll find out later, also sometimes known as OH, with a little bit more information, is hydroxide. Okay. A very strong base, kind of like melt your face. H2O, on the other hand, water doesn't really melt your face. Okay? Or if we throw in another example, H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, melt your face. Okay? So we can get different compounds, and those compounds will have different properties. Okay? If we go through and look at the right, I put this image on because I kind of like it. It's all kind of weird, scripty, old looking. Okay? But at the top, can anybody tell me what that word is? Elements. And if we look at it, under is elements, because then we start seeing like two things. That doesn't make sense, because that's now a compound. We only got 24-ish uh, elements. Why are there only 24? Don't we have 118? Because we hadn't even discovered all the elements yet. We hadn't actually purified and said this is its own unique thing. Right? But in that process, he dealt with 24, and then he also went through and said, well, if you combined those, you got new compounds. So we started to actually come up with that table of compounds, which somebody suggested over here. That might have been you. Is that you? Table of compounds? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And he's starting to summarize this. Okay. Periodic table that we work with versus Dalton's periodic table. Which is cooler? Okay, this one. Why is this one cooler? Lots of pictures. Okay. How many of you actually want to write out a formula like H2O using those pictures? So some people are bigger shaking their head than no. The rest of you are like, no, it'd look cool. Okay. Draw DNA. <laughs> okay. That's not just the letter D and A. We're now looking at all the elements go into that. Okay, we're looking at millions of elements going into that. To even remotely approach trying to represent that, it's going to take pages and pages and pages okay, with those pictures. So we started with a pictorial representation of our elements and decided that the letter symbols made a little more sense. Okay. This was initially Dalton's pass. Okay. About 100 years later, we get to Thompson. Okay. And Thompson is really the first challenge or official challenge to Dalton's theory. Okay? And his theory goes through and says that actually atoms can be divided. Thompson says we have electrons and we have protons. Okay? Notice they're not on the periodic table of elements. Why not? They're not elements. They're, not elements. Okay? they're subatomic particles. Okay? So in his research, what he was able to know was that electrons had a net charge of a negative one, or a relative charge of negative one. And protons had a relative charge of positive one. Okay. This would be like referencing debt and income. Income is positive, debt is negative. Right? I'm not specifying how much income or how much debt. I'm just saying relative to each other, one is negative, one is positive. Okay. That's all that he's going through and defining here. Okay. So I found this kind of interesting. Well, if he was able to discover this, why did Dalton not know this information? Okay. Why did we have to wait an extra 100 years to figure this out? Okay. Wasn't observable. Why wasn't it observable? Okay. What technology? Okay. Microscope, we still can't see electrons and protons, okay. even with our microscopes today. Uh, somebody somewhere, I'm sure, will challenge me. But for the most part, we can't. Observation. Okay. When you walk through space, or let's look at it this way, 
And you see the little boxes around the room on the sides with those little weird pluggy things? What's in those weird pluggy things? Electricity. What's generating that electricity? Sort of. Electricity sounds kind of like electron because they're the same thing. When we're looking at electricity, it's the flow of electrons coming out of the wall. Okay? So that's kind of cool. We've got the flow of electrons coming out of the wall. So why did they not have that? Okay, well, they had to come up with some way to control it and generate it. Okay, well, why isn't that just existing? Can I just walk through space and bump into an electron? Not really. Imagine if we could. I'm walking through space and I just happen to walk into a wall of electrons. That's kind of like sticking my finger into an electrical outlet randomly as I'm walking down the wall. That's not going to be pleasant. Okay? So electrons are insanely unstable. So are protons. Why are they so unstable? They're charged. Charge is an inherently high energy thing. So it takes energy to be able to control and manipulate where that charge is moving. All things strive for neutrality. So what happens if electrons just floating around in free space? It gets attracted to a proton right? and combines to then neutralize that charge. So we don't experience it. If we don't experience it, we can't observe it. Right? So what did we need to make sure we could observe those? That's a really tricky question. Because right? as we move through air, let's say, here, I've got an electron. Bzzz, there's my electron. It's at the tip of my finger, and I now want to make an observation on it. What is also at the tip of my finger? Yeah, because it's the tip of my finger. And what's on the tip of my finger? Matter. And matter has... Our atoms, which means the electron immediately comes back to my finger and I can't observe it. Okay, well, I'm just going to make an electron then kind of in the space here because there's nothing in that space, right? The space directly in front of me, there's nothing there, right? Nothing. So that when I walk into that space, I'm going to pass out because I can't breathe, right? I see some of you are like, do it, do it. <laughs> I'm not passing out, why not? Is there something in that space? Yes, there's air. There's also atoms there. So to generate an electron, I have to make sure there's no atoms around it. How do I do get something that has no atoms around it? I need a vacuum. How do I generate a vacuum? I need something that can suck all the air out of a chamber. This discovery hinged on making a vacuum that was strong enough that there was no particles there. Right? Once we have a vacuum... I can then seal that system up, and I can generate two kind of electrodes. And if I put enough current on it, electrons will then come out of one end to try and cancel out at the other. <coughs> because in the past case there was air, what happened? The electron came out, hit the air, nothing happened. Once we pulled a vacuum on it, there's now no air in it. So what does the electron do? Now it can actually move. And it can move through the chamber until it can try and cancel out. Interesting observations behind that is electrons don't move in straight, nice lines, and they will jump around a little bit. In that jumping around, they do hit some particles because we aren't at a perfect vacuum. What do those particles do when an electron hits them? Ow, that hurts. Stop it. And in the process of saying stop it, what have they done visually? They've emitted light. And so we see this odd glow to our chamber. That glow now says, well, I put a vacuum on it that said there's nothing in it. Well, if there's nothing there and yet I put this electric current behind it, there must be something that's charged coming out of that. To add to that, I can put magnets on either end of this. Why magnets? What do magnets have associated with them? a charge in north and south end. And what happens to the electron beam? It will shift towards or away from the magnet, depending on which polarity you put there. So these observations allow us to say, yes, electrons exist. Because I know electrons exist, what else do I know has to exist? Protons, because otherwise 
life would be exciting. More exciting. Life would be exciting. Okay? So this was Thomson's model. We've got electrons and we've got protons. Okay? So he said, well, what is an atom then? An atom must be composed of these electrons and protons. Because he was able to physically observe electrons, he said electrons must be these kind of free-floating chunks. Okay? And the rest of the atom is now a combination of positive charges, and the electrons are sitting in that. And that when we somehow generate electric current, we're ejecting those electrons from the atom that then continues on the process. So he just said we had this sea of positive. And this is what he famously gets called for the plum pudding model. Right? So we're mentioning this for two reasons. Number one, we now have Thomson associated with electrons and protons because of a vacuum. And uh, I actually didn't say it, but the cathode ray tube. Okay. Cool. Nice discovery. He then theorizes something else. You all read, is this theory valid? No. It's actually completely and utterly wrong. Okay. Virtually no aspect of the plum pudding model is actually valid. Okay. So why do we bother to talk about Thompson? Thompson's important for science. When we look at how science advances, typically what gets told is the story behind how good he was at discovering electrons and protons. Thompson's kind of a weird exception because everybody likes to make fun of his plum pudding model. Okay. But it's just a theory. It was a theory that somebody else later came through and disproved. Before we get there, though, I like to throw this one in because of the science again on this. Millikan and Fletcher generated an experiment to actually determine what the charge was on an electron. I don't care what the number is, but they just wanted to define it. What is the exact value? Okay. What is my exact income? Okay. So how do they do that? They took one of those little like old school perfume spray things and filled it with oil. And when they sprayed that, what came out of it? Droplets of oil. What do those droplets of oil then do? And then fall. It's gravity. Cool. Okay. Interesting thing about oil droplets, though, is they do collect charge. So like if we did the static electricity walk. Okay. By getting sprayed out, they pick up a charge. So we now have charged particles that are falling. Okay. In and of itself, that's not a big deal. We've got lots of charged particles falling. It could be difficult to see them. So they created a little slit at the bottom of their chamber where, in theory, only one particle would fall through. So they can have a microscope at one end, and they can look through this tube and be like, look at that droplet falling. How cool is that? Not really. It's not cool at all. Okay. That, if that was the end of the experiment, it was pretty dumb. Okay. What they went through and did is recognize, though, that it's charged. And it's charged with electrons. Okay. By being able to see it, they could measure the size of the droplet so they could determine its mass. Because we know Newton, we now also know the downward force from physics. That little chamber is not just a special little chamber. It has an electric current wired up to it. So as the electron falls down, it gets closer and closer to the bottom plate. The bottom plate is what charge? Negatively charged. What happens when that negative gets near another negative? They oppose each other. They oppose each other. And what they have now created is a mini levitation device. Mini oil droplet, right? Okay. That droplet falls. And what they have to do is modulate the current just enough so that the oil droplet levitates perfectly. Okay. If they don't do it fast enough, what happens? Droplet falls all the way down, experiment's done. If they modulate and give it too much current, what happens to the droplet? Launches back up and gets stuck to the top of the device and they have to restart. Okay. So they have to modulate it perfectly enough to get it to levitate. Once it levitates, they can now make a comparison. They know the downward force of gravity is equal to the upward force from the electric current. They can set those equal to each other to determine what the exact charge is on the droplet. Okay. How many of you think this would be an easy thing to observe? Okay, not at all. Which means the end result of that calculation is probably wrong. Okay, so what do we have to do? Do it again. 
so we can average our results. So they probably did this experiment hundreds, if not thousands of times, and averaged the results to get an answer. Turns out their answer is nearly spot on. Okay. I think that is absolutely fascinating and cool. Add to it, it adds another layer of science behind this. Most people tie this experiment to Millikan. Why? Millikan was the primary investigator behind the experiment. What was Fletcher? Fletcher was the graduate student that sat there and probably did all these measure measurements. Okay. Admittedly, Millikan was pretty much the brain behind the whole process, so he definitely deserves credit. Don't get me wrong there. Okay. But Fletcher was the one that did all the work, and yet he doesn't get as much of the respect if you look at the broader community. Why not? Science. It's actually the default process of how we do science. Okay. That said, people in the know were aware that he was the one that did all the work, which meant as soon as he graduated, what did we, he have? Yeah. An instant job, pretty much wherever he wanted to go. Nobel Prize went to Millikan, Fletcher got nothing. Okay. Except a good job. Okay. And he later went on to do some other discoveries too. So. But just an interesting story there. So back to Thompson. There's Thompson's model up at the top. Rutherford comes along. I like to say that Rutherford didn't like Thompson. It turns out they were like best friends. Okay. Um, so why would I make that statement? So if we go through and look at this, Rutherford said, okay, let's test your theory. Okay. If your theory is true, if I launch these particles, and we'll talk about the alpha particles in a second, at atoms, those particles should just pass through. We'll have to be a thin enough sheet. Okay. So we picked a thin gold foil. And he said, if Thompson's model is true, I fire the particles and they go straight through the sheet. Okay. Well, how would I know they go straight through the sheet? We're looking at things that are insanely tiny. Turns out alpha particles are radioactive. And what I can do is put a piece of film behind it. Right. When the alpha particle hits the film, what does the film do? It reacts, changes color that I can then see. So I know the alpha particle went straight through. Right. Why would I make the suggestion that Rutherford didn't like Thompson? If he liked Thompson, where's the film go? Right there. Because what is he going to show? Particles pass straight through. Oh, look, Thompson, your theory must be perfectly valid because they just pass through. Right? And instead, what did he do? He went all the way around the entire sample. Okay. Well, if he believes Thompson, what's going to happen out on the excess pieces of film? Nothing. Nothing. What ends up happening? They see particles bounce back. Okay. The only reason things bounce is because they hit something. If we look at Thompson's model, what is there to hit? <laughs> Nothing. Okay. So something has to be in there that has enough mass to cause the particle to bounce. Okay. This goes back to what the alpha particle is. The alpha particle is a charged ball of mass. That charge happens to be a positive charge. What would happen if the positive charge got near an electron? Stick to it. At best, it sticks to it. It doesn't bounce. So what does that mean is happening with the positive charges? That would cause them to push away, but it would have to have enough mass of positive charge to cause it to push. So what does that mean all the positive charges need to be? They all need to be condensed into a single space so that when the alpha particle comes at, if it encounters that single collection of positive charges, then it would bounce. Otherwise, what would happen? It would pass straight through. Okay? And we end up seeing both results. It passes through and it bounces. Okay? What are alpha particles? It's another thing that's not in the book for those of you taking notes. Just like Millikan. Alpha particles are a form of radioactivity. 
Remember, we need to make sure we know exactly why something is happening. Radioactivity is dangerous because it emits these high energy particles, and in the process of emitting those particles, it changes its, uh, its core identity, right? Which then means it does new radioactive things, right? So if we look at a standard radioactive sample, it's not clean, it's not pure, which means it's not firing just alpha particles, it's also doing other stuff. That other stuff could be causing the weird results we're seeing here which means the source of my alpha particles had better be clean. Okay? So what has to happen before Rutherford can do his experiment? Somebody needs to clean radioactive particles. Who's that somebody? <laughs> no, not a college student, but unfortunately, probably pretty close as far as priority. Uh, let's see, do I actually write it? Oh, I didn't actually write it down. That's kind of mean to me. Curie. I'm like, what do you mean? How is Curie like a college student? <laughs> Madam Mary Curie. The woman thing is really a woman. So you'd be like, you're a jerk, Mike. I'm just pointing out what's happening here. Okay? This is early, eight, or early 1900s. Women don't have the right to vote. They don't have a right to an education. And we have Mary Curie here coming in and purifying and providing the source of alpha particles that allows for the fundamental understanding of what an atom is. That's pretty freaking cool. Okay? Add to that about Mary Curie. Okay? There are two people in the history of the Nobel Prize that have won two Nobel Prizes. Actually, I think there's a few more than that. Uh, I could be wrong. We'll go back and forth on that. Mary Curie is one of them. The other one is Linus Pauling. Pauling won one for science and for peace. Eh, peace. Who cares? <laughs> Curie won two. Physics and chemistry. So you're like, man, chemistry's hard. Throw freaking physics into it, and she did the same thing. She won it for two hardcore sciences. Doesn't have the right to vote, doesn't have a right to an education. Okay? Insanely brilliant woman to go through that process and to deal with that trauma. Looking at her history, it's even more kind of shocking what she's had to live through it's, or what she lived through. It's pretty intense. Okay? The last thing I like to throw on it was like, well, the Nobel Prize acknowledged how awesome she was. She did a lot of her research in France. Every country has their own National Academy of Sciences. Like, we have the U.S. National, I don't know, some National Academy of Sciences. Okay? The French equivalent, okay, you collect. Like, those people are like, we are the smartest brains in this country. We're all going to come together so we can now tell everybody we're the smartest brains in the world, right? The French National Academy of Sciences said Mary Curie couldn't join. Why not? Because she was a woman. Okay. They later kind of retroactively added her after they realized they were kind of idiots. Okay. But this is pretty phenomenal for a woman to go through and contribute. So I like to address this because we see very low enrollment of women in sciences. Okay. Because we tend to exclude them for how we think about it. Mary Curie is a big kind of exception to this. Even fighting against that, she was able to come up with some pretty amazing discoveries. Okay? The larger lesson is everybody should be involved in science because everybody has the ability to contribute to that field. Okay? I'm not a Mary Curie by any stretch of the imagination, and I never will be. Okay? But somebody in this room could be if you spend that time to really push at it. And I'm not suggesting that you necessarily do that, but you should be inclusive of everybody making that leap. And it doesn't have to be women necessarily. Okay? You will hear me mention this a lot, okay? and I think people, I've actually had comments that I'm kind of a jerk about it, kind of a jerk about a lot of things. Describe Rutherford. White male. Thompson or Milliken, Fletcher. White male. White male. Thompson white male. Okay? The sciences were heavily controlled by white male. Intentionally or not, okay? 
That's how it was established. When we start to bring in other points of view and other backgrounds, we can increase our growth within the field. So this isn't saying white males shouldn't be in science. Okay? It's saying that we all need to be inclusive of everybody else contributing to science okay? and helping those that may not have that same knowledge base. Okay? So, fired alpha particles. Yay, new theory. His new theory is that we have a nucleus. Okay, why did he call it a nucleus? No, uh, we could call it nuclear particles. It's kind of the Latin root of nuclear, like a nuclear family has a particular meaning. Okay, so they're using the Latin root for being a center. Okay, so we have the nucleus. In that nucleus is going to be all of my protons. Where are the electrons going to be? Somewhere outside. You have no clue where they are. There's kind of a big problem with this theory. What happened when the alpha particle got near the nucleus? It bounced. Why? What was the charge of the alpha particle? Positive. What's the charge of our proton? Positive. Every atom we've got on our periodic table has more protons. Where am I putting all of those positive charges? In the exact same space. Why is that a problem? What are all those positive charges going to do? They're going to repel away from each other. According to his theory, that doesn't happen. So what does Rutherford then say why that's allowed to happen? Because something else is there. We take a look at our nucleus. It's not just all one color here. We have two different colors. Why two different colors? Because there's two different particles. We'll have the protons, and then he's saying there's something else there. I don't know what it is. I can't prove it. But I think there's something else there that's going to hold those protons together. I'm going to call that the glue. Okay? That glue can't be positively charged because that's going to make things worse. And it can't be negatively charged because I already have electrons. So it has to be neutral, so I will call it a neutron. Okay? An idea of scale here, if we scale things up so we get powers of 10, those are always fun in this class, but let's drop in powers of 10. Okay? If I take an atom and make it the size of the Superdome, okay? I've never been there, but football stadiums look big on TV. Okay? The nucleus is the size of a marble in the middle of that Superdome. So what contributes to size of an atom? All the electrons. Okay. All of the mass is in that marble. The size of the atom or the volume that that atom takes up is all dictated based on the electrons, not based off the protons and ultimately the mass. Okay. What happens further on down the road? We've got this theory. He's got neutrons. Chadwick comes through and says, I've got an experiment that will prove that neutrons exist. So Chadwick was later able to discover that. Okay? Here's the fun reason behind all of these names. Thompson was Rutherford's boss. Then Rutherford graduated, became his own boss. Guess what Chadwick was? Rutherford's student. Then became his own boss and was able to prove neutrons. So they're all intricately tied to each other. The big thing that comes out of this is our summary for subatomic particles. You need to know everything within that. Okay? So when we talk about electrons, the symbol we'll use is E. Okay? The location, not in the nucleus. Protons and neutrons are embedded in the nucleus. Relative charges. An electron will be negatively charged. If I don't want to write negative 1, I can show that charge in the upper right-hand corner of my symbol. Why did I pick E to represent electron? It starts with E. It starts with e. We don't have to be creative. Okay? Mass. How many of you want to remember 1 over 180? That number for the mass. No? You don't want to memorize that? Okay. Roughly the equivalent of this, okay, saying, here, I'm an atom. I'm going to remove an electron. Did my mass just change? For those of you that weren't looking, I just ripped a hair out of my head. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> Did my mass just change? Yes. Yeah. Was it significant? No. no. 
what is the effective mass of the electron? Insignificant. Give me something better, because I am lazy and I don't want to write insignificant. Our relative mass for the electron is zero. Okay. All of these individual facts need to be memorized. Okay. What we will end up doing is then applying that memorized fact out to the structure of the rest of our atom and use that to explain a lot of the observables that we see for our atoms. Okay. So where does that take us? Chapter 4, we've got our scientist summary, all the cool scientists. You should know their experiment. Okay. Key words of their experiment. Okay. And what was discovered. Okay. The links between them are cool, but I won't test you on that. I think we're still in Chapter 4 a little bit here with atomic notation. In atomic notation, we're now layering this information on. We already had some atomic notation because we have symbols. We know the symbols are tied to names. We now want to include the information about our protons and neutrons. Atomic notation is poorly labeled. It's not atomic notation. Okay. Because what is in an atom? Protons, neutrons, electrons. Let's take a look at our atomic notation. The A symbol represents the mass number. Yeah, whatever. No, that would be the mass, okay. but this isn't saying the mass. Okay. This is really only looking at the nucleus. This notation is only revel relevant for nuclear physicists, because what is a nuclear physicist concerned about? The nucleus. Why? What do nuclear physicists typically study? Radiation. Okay. Nuclear radiation. Okay. That radiation happens when the nucleus gets big enough. What contributes to the size of the nucleus? Protons and neutrons. So as a nuclear physicist, I'm concerned about the size of my nucleus. The first piece of information I want to find in my symbol will be the size of my nucleus, the protons and neutrons. That's why we're formatted this way. Because this is not atomic notation, this is nuclear notation. I'm concerned about the size of the nucleus. Okay? The nucleus has protons and neutrons. For whatever reason, I also decide to separate out the atomic number. Why would I separate out the atomic number? For giggles, it's fun. Why is it a bit weird to have to separate that out? What if instead of saying SY... I write that as C. What is C? Carbon. Looking at carbon, do I know either of those numbers using the periodic table? Yes. Technically, I only know one of them, which is the atomic number. Where is the atomic number found on my periodic table? The atomic number is written in the top right, not underneath like it is here. Okay? That atomic number is 6. Okay? So by writing C, what have I found? I already know the atomic number. Okay? So if I wrote C, do I also need to include Z as 6? What if that was atomic number 7? Would it still be C? What if it was 5? No. This is redundant information. Okay? The symbol and the atomic number will always be tied to each other. The periodic table will tell you that information. Is the mass number given on the periodic table? No. The atomic weight is which is kind of a bad way of saying it. They should really be saying the atomic mass. Okay? But even then, the atomic mass is not the mass number. No. If you take the mass number and the atomic number and subtract them, you would get the number of neutrons. 
but you cannot take the atomic mass because the atomic mass or atomic weight is something else entirely. The mass number would have to be given to you. So if I go through and now say that I am looking at carbon 13, what am I saying? The 13 is my mass number. My symbol becomes 13. Now how many neutrons do I have for carbon 13? Seven. Now I would know I have 7 because I can do the math. If I can set that up right. 7 neutrons. We will come back to what that atomic weight is or the atomic mass is. It is something else entirely different. Okay? Entirely. Related, but different. Okay? Skip that for the moment. Do you guys want to see a quick example on it? Yeah. Okay. So we've got an example given here. Uh, the element is what? How do you know it's silicon? Okay. The symbol is SI. How do I know that means silicon? You memorize the name to the symbol. This is that part that you have to do. Okay. The atomic number is 14 because it's written in the lower left-hand corner. What does the atomic number mean? The atomic number is the number of protons. There are 14 protons in this structure. Okay. With a mass number of 29, the atom of silicon, uh, and the language here is poorly written. Okay. If I know I have 29 as a mass number, I know the number of protons plus the number of neutrons must equal that. Do I know the number of protons? Yes. yes. So I can sub in. And I can say neutrons equals 29 minus 14, which equals 36. 29 minus 14? Just checking. <laughs> 15? 15. That is now the number of neutrons. Okay? So it's looking at the basic kind of addition and subtraction between those, and we now have the basic formula behind that. Okay, where we will pick up on Thursday is shortly after that, and we will be doing isotopes on Thursday because we're like a slide or two away from it.